Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. I am the Reverend Dr. Sally Wicks and it is my privilege to welcome you here this day for this service of worship. Friends, we are here today to worship God and to give thanks for the life of Steve Eldridge. Hear these words of scripture. God is our refuge and strength, says the psalmist, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear. I am the resurrection and the life, said Jesus. Those who believe in me shall live, even though they die. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Peace I leave with you, said Jesus. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. As we gather today in the presence of God to give thanks for Steve's life, we should remember that faith was a huge part of Steve's life. Steve was raised in the church, largely in this congregation, and was faithful to God his whole life long. So I think it is appropriate that we should begin this service of worship by singing a song that speaks of God's faithfulness to us our whole lives long. I invite you to stand and join me in singing I Was There to Hear Your Borning Cry, number 488, in your hymnals. <laughs> You may be seated. Let us pray. Most merciful and ever living God, we are grateful this day for the great company of all those who have kept the faith, finished their race, and now rest from their labor. Especially we thank you for Steve 
whom you have now received into your presence, we trust him to your goodness and to your promise of new life. Eternal God, your love for us is everlasting. You can turn the shadow of death into the brightness of the morning light. Help us now to turn to you with believing hearts. Speak to us of eternal things so that hearing the promises of scripture, we may have hope and be lifted out of our distress into the peace of your presence through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Stephen C. Eldridge was born March 21st, 1944 to Cliff and Mary Eldridge of Little Rock, Arkansas. He had only one sister at the time, Pat, and the family would move to South Bend, Indiana by the time Steve was two. There his parents would add three more children, Sherrod, Janet, and Robert. Steve's dad owned a beer distribution company, which Steve would later join up to. His mother was very busy uh, with those five children at home. The family moved to Elkhart in 1959 when Steve was 14. And one of the first things that Steve and his family would do was to affiliate with First Presbyterian Church here in Elkhart. Our records show that Steve actually joined the church here in 1959, transferring his membership from First Presbyterian in South Bend. Steve was very proud to have gone to Elkhart High School here in Elkhart. When my husband and I first came to town, Steve helped us to find a house and we heard lots of stories about growing up as a teenager here in Elkhart while we were driving all over the city with Steve. Always a social guy, Steve had lots of friends in high school. He was a good student, a member of the Honors Society, salutatorian of his class. He was a smart guy. Probably won't surprise some of you that he was a math guy. He was, a, he was always into the numbers. He was the business manager for the yearbook and treasurer of the student council. And he did all of this in addition to holding down a part-time job. And all of this sounds exactly like the responsible Steve Eldridge that I know. So it might surprise some of you to learn that uh, Steve was also a bit of a prankster in his younger years. He liked to have a little fun. So he and a friend used to ride their bikes over to the dances at Tippy Canoe. Apparently sometimes they rode on the same bike and I understand that at one point they were even hit by a drunk driver and uh, survived it and got bruised up and banged up but were okay. I'm not actually sure that anybody in the family knew that Steve and his friend were heading out to Tippecanoe for the, for the dances. He seemed to be kind of an independent guy. There were also stories about driving cars from the back seat with your feet. I don't know how you do that. Somebody can explain it to me later. Then there was the story about how he and his buddies used to like to um, take their his six-year-old younger brother and feed him a whole can of coke and then turn him upside down and hang him from his feet so they could listen to him gurgle. My favorite story, however, was that um, Steve and his buddy saw there was a new car uh, in, in his buddy's neighborhood and um, decided to, t to borrow it and take it out for a spin. And um, they were just borrowing it. And they brought it back to the house and there was a police car in the drive. Um, apparently somebody thought they were stealing the car, so Steve ran out back and dove into the river and swam over to the other side trying to get away to his house on the other side of the river. Um, and when he got to his house, there was a police car waiting for him there. <laughs> and an officer saying, I need to talk to you, young man. Apparently he got through it all right. One wonders what his parents thought about this, or if they even knew, knew. Because Steve was just this kind of independent guy, made decisions for himself. So when Steve decided that he wanted to go to college, 
He just packed a bag and left. Not sure if he ever told his parents. Now many of you know that he was a big IU fan, so it will surprise you to learn that he started at Purdue. He went first to Purdue. Lasted three days, decided, decided he didn't like Purdue and went on down to IU. And that's where he enrolled in the University School of Business, studying finance and uh, working his way through college, paid for it himself, worked his way through as a houseboy uh, to a local soror sorority. And all of these comings and goings and activities as he was making his way toward adulthood, it appears to me that Steve just seized life with both hands, fearlessly. He relied on himself, and I think he relied on his God. Carol said the other day that faith for Steve was just a given. He didn't feel like he needed to study it or think about it an awful lot to believe. He just accepted Christian faith. He relied on God and was determined to be God's servant in whatever way he could. I'm reminded of Psalm 121 as I think about Steve. The psalmist is simply confident that God is near. God is trustworthy. God is watching over him. Here's how the psalmist puts it. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time and forevermore. Now among the many wonderful things that happened for Steve at college, I think Steve would agree that the most wonderful that thing that came about at college was Carol. Such a love story. Steve and Carol met at the beginning of their junior year at IU. Carol said the other day that just before she left for school that fall term, she had a conversation with her parents and she said, oh, I just wish I could meet a nice guy so that I could have a relationship like the two of you have, saying to her parents. And when she got to school that fall, her sorority sisters um, were all abuzz and they had plans and they said they had plans to go out with some of the guys from Delta Upsilon fraternity over to Brown County for a beer. And Carol wasn't sure that she was interested in going, but they insisted that she join them and so Carol kind of dragged her feet that, that day, coming down the stairs. And as the girls were coming down the stairs, they were kind of pairing off with some of the DU guys. And, and Steve was at the bottom of the stairs and not interested in any of these girls. And Carol, turns out, was the last one to come down. And, and so Steve was stuck with her. She was the last one. <laughs> I'll bet Steve would have a different way of ending this story. That's, that's Carol's version. So Carol said it was, um, it was rather an odd night for her. She wasn't feeling very well. And, um, and Steve had this car that was very unreliable and that, that the whole um, caravan had to get out and push his car at one point because it just didn't run very well. Um, but apparently Steve had a good time. Um, and at the end of the night, he said he'd be back in the morning to pick her up for church. And he tossed her his wallet just to prove that he was going to left it with her just to prove that he was coming back. She said she doubted he would show up, but when she heard a backfire outside the house, <laughs> she knew it must be Steve. He took her to First Presbyterian in Bloomington, and she said that while she was sitting there, she took her first good look at this guy that had brought her to church and decided she liked what she saw. So Steve and Carol, started dating. Oh, they went to concerts and to sorority and fraternity events and they went dancing. Oh, they liked to dance together. I understand they were pretty good at it. Carol said 
being with Steve, it was the first time that she felt she could be totally herself. And by the end of, um, of that junior year, they were inseparable. And Steve, not wanting to be parted from Carol, took a grubby, miserable job with the city of Peoria, cleaning out uh, old housing and staying in the YMCA so that he could live near Carol that summer where her parents lived in Peoria. And at some point during, at the end of that summer, I suppose, he invited his parents to come down and have dinner with her parents and, and all of them together, and Steve proposed in front of the entire family. They were married in December of their senior year, thought it would be lovely, romantic, to have a Christmas wedding. They were only 20. And they moved into a small two-room apartment that was the front half of a, a, a house that they had to share with a couple of guys who rented the back half of the house and they had to share the bathroom with these guys. <laughs> Carol says that she can't imagine how, how she agreed to sharing the bathroom with two strangers who lived in the back of the house. But she said that uh, Steve, whenever she wanted to go in to have a bath or to primp, would go in and scour the whole bathroom so it would be clean for her. Sounds like Steve to me. Carol said they had no food, no money, and this very impractical car. I have to tell you about this car a little bit. It was an MGA with small windows that clipped into the car and uh, heat that only worked on the driver's side of the car. It, it apparently had what something called a supercharger um, to run the car so that if you shifted into the lower gear it, it had a chance of stalling. She said at one point they were driving from Elkhart to Bloomington with a carload of um, wedding gifts and the car wasn't working very well, the supercharger wasn't working very well and they were afraid that if they stopped the car, if they braked and stopped the car that it, it wouldn't start again, they'd never make it. And so when they would come to one of those small towns and there was a stoplight Steve would just turn right and go around the block and just go around the block again and again until the car, the light turned green so that they could make it to Bloomington. Apparently at one point they finally got stuck behind a semi and, and had to brake and stop the car and it died. And they had to call a friend to come and pick them up. As I listened to Carol talk about those early years and really about her entire marriage, I think the two of them lived on love. It was just clear that Steve and Carol had this beautiful love story that blossomed early on and never really quit their whole lives long. The writer of the Song of Solomon puts it this way. He says, set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is strong as death, passion fierce as the grave, its flashes are flashes of fire, a raging flame. I think Steve had set Carol as a seal upon his heart, and Carol set Steve as a seal upon her arm very early on, and they were steadfast in their love for one another. Carol and Steve graduated in 1966. Steve's degree was in finance and Carol's in education. Steve decided he should go on immediately and get his MBA at Bradley University and Carol taught third grade. They had a new apartment in Peoria which had its own bathroom so they were moving up in the world. After Steve finished his masters he got a a, a good job with Arthur Anderson in Chicago and they bought their first home in Skokie. Stacy was born in 1969, a huge joy to Steve and Carol. And Sarah came along, a second huge joy in 73, after the family had moved uh, to Memphis for a few years. Then in 1975, Steve's dad asked him to come home to Elkhart to help with that beer distribution business. Steve and Carol thought about it long and hard, and they realized that if they remained with Arthur Anderson, they'd probably be moving around quite a bit from city to city, 
and they'd never have a chance to put down roots. Elkhart was a wonderful community and they decided that moving home would allow them to put down those long lasting roots. And so they bought their home on Greenleaf and have been there ever since, almost 50 years. How's that for roots? So Steve and Carol, when they moved to town, joined First Presbyterian here in Elkhart, this church, Steve for the second time, moving his membership from the Presbyterian Church in Memphis. And they began sinking those roots deep into the Elkhart community. Steve was in that beer distribution business until 1992 when he switched to real estate um, and was an award-winning real estate agent. And in addition, in the meantime, Steve served as president of the City Planning Commission for 40 years, 20 years of those as president of the Elkhart Redevelopment Commission. He served in the Presbyterian Church as an elder, a trustee, and treasurer multiple times over. He was on the board of the Alcona Country Club and their treasurer. He was a United Way volunteer, a board member of Salvation Army, president of the Samaritan Center of Elkhart, and a member of the Rotary Club. He was twice given the keys to the city for his volunteer work over the years. Such a servant. Mayor Rod Robertson has asked if he might say a few words in memory of Steve today, and so I'd like to ask Mayor Robertson to come up. Good morning. I always get a little heebie-jeebies when I get in the pulpit. Um, I, uh, I just want to say that um, to the family, um, obviously Steve's level of service was not just uh, felt by those of us who have lived in the city, but for those of us who work in municipal government. and. My history goes back with him a long way, um, for those of you who don't know. Uh, he graduated with my uncle, Coley Webb, in 62, here in Elkhart. And when I was a kid, I went to Canaan Baptist Church. And we would do exchanges with First Presbyterian. And I would go to the Sunday school at times, and there would be an exchange of kids that would go to Canaan as well. And it was always an outreach, and I remember Steve at that age, and he made me remember him uh, beyond that, because when I left uh, Elkhart in, after graduating from Elkhart Central and went to Northwestern and stayed 20 years away, uh, one of the things that I did uh, was work in management for Miller Brewing Company. And so when I returned home, we used to have beer conversations. Uh, and I was old enough to have a beer at that time. Uh, but it was always a relationship that was built in him having a, a sense of understanding and empathy for what my life had led me to do. And when I decided that uh, I wanted to serve, uh, I remember having a conversation about, with him before I was appointed to the Redevelopment Commission, in which he was the the president of. And that was my first level of service with the city um, and had no idea it would end up where I am now. Um, I just wanted to serve. Just what can I do to serve? And so as we talked and as I learned the Redevelopment Commission and as I learned what the city does, um, it was wonderful to have someone there that I could bounce ideas off of and to make sure that you know we had conversations uh, that were really, really deep. Um, he knew I had a heart for service. Uh, uh, we weren't of the same party, but um, the things that we talked about were things that, that were about service to people. And it always remained that way every time we spoke. And so uh, I've gone to many, many of these, way too many, 
uh, funerals and services uh, throughout my tenure in the last four years. And I always thought that there was a way in which I could be with families uh, that were committed to the city of Elkhart uh, in a manner in which I was with them when those things, when these unfortunate situations occur. And there, I found over the course of the years, uh, the last four years, that I knew a lot of them. I tried to make sure that I was at ones that are people who served, but for the people I knew it was special, like this one. And so um, I want to say to Carol, thank you for your level of service to the community as well. Um, there are many places that I know you volunteered in the same manner uh, to serve uh, for us. And that is the way that we as a community make our relationship together important. And, and it's in that spirit that I, um, I read this. And I want to make sure to let everyone know that um, I remember asking Steve to put a sign up when I first ran for city council. <laughs> he said, he said, now, I support you. <laughs> But I don't think I can put your side in my yard. <laughs> uh, and I loved it because I knew he supported me. It wasn't that he couldn't put the side in the yard, but I understood. Because it's funny when you have a relationship with someone. It's not about all of the actions that are made or whether you're told yes or no. It's about the relationship continuing through the yes and no's. And that's why we as a community can build wonderful things and he worked hard to do it when he was on the plan commission and the redevelopment commission. And I know he did because I served under him. And so Elkhart is a better place because he was in it and he was working to make sure that we were all guided by that. So in memoriam to Steve C. Eldridge, the city of Elkhart mourns the loss of Steve C. Eldridge a devout servant. Stephen served in, in the U.S. Army Reserve as well as the city of Elkhart for 40 years and as president of the Plan Commission in 20, those year, 20 of those years as president of the city's redevelopment commission. He loved his community and he volunteered his time and talents in several organizations. A loving husband, father, grandfather, brother, uncle, and dear friend, Stephen was, will be missed by all. We mourn alongside Stephen's family, friends, and the entire Elkhart community. We thank him for sharing his talents with the world and for making Elkhart proud everywhere he went. Mayor Rod Robertson. Thank you, Mayor Robertson. Steve was indeed a servant of the community. He was a servant of the church. He was a man that wanted to do right by his community and by his family and by his church. He wanted Elkhart to be a good place, a right place, a welcoming place for all people. The prophet Micah talks about what we can expect to find in a good man. Micah writes, God has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. I think Steve lived by those words. Steve's good character was probably most evident to his immediate family. He just took care of people. That was, that was his way of being. 
He took care of his parents as they were aging. He took care of his wife and his daughters. He was everyone's humble spirit, servant. Stacy and Sarah said he was the most amazing father. They said that their father did everything for them, that he treated them like princesses, I think was their term, that he never was too tired for them. He taught them how to snow ski, how to water ski. He taught them math around the kitchen table. He taught them how to mend broken relationships, how to get out of bad relationships kindly. He was infinitely patient, a good listener, and didn't force his ideas on them. Sarah remembered one time when um, Steve was actually unwell, he, he needed to get to the hospital. He had an oozing wound, and he discovered that Sarah was um, trying to get some tickets picked up for a, a game that she wanted to go to, and so Steve went out uh, against everybody else's better judgment to go get those tickets, and only after the tickets were bought would he agree to let people take him to the hospital. Stacy said that she could call her dad about anything, that he was always a safe call, that he would never respond negatively to, to uh, what was going on in her life. They all agreed that Steve was a doer, wanted to be busy. Even at the end of his life when he was having trouble getting around, he insisted on doing the dishes and the laundry because he wanted to help out. They remembered a recent visit to Jan and Jerry's house up near Manistee, where the family liked to gather. And the family wanted to go out for walks and explore the dunes and the parks, and Steve really couldn't do that at that point. So he stayed home and refinished a kitchen table for the family. <laughs> when Steve had his 60th birthday, Sarah wrote a page of 10 reasons why I love my dad Here's just a few of them. Number nine, he let me dress myself when my mom said, no way. <laughs> Number five, no, six, number six, he always makes sure our family has dessert. Number five, he gave me the confidence to make me believe I could accomplish anything. And number three, he has shown me that kindness and acceptance of others is the way to lead my life. Carol wrote a letter to Steve for that same party in which she quoted Eleanor Roosevelt who once said, most of the good work in the world is done by people who weren't feeling all the, that well the day that they did it. And Carol continued, I think of so many times when Steve sacrificed his own desires for the desires of others when he wasn't really feeling great himself. I'm not sure how you quantify such loving kindness. Steve's grandson, I think, summed it up well. Nicholas, when he said of his grandfather, it was never really about him. And Stacy simply said, he was perfect. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, tried to describe the kind of love that we are called to have for one another as Christian people. Here's what Paul says about love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no records of wrong. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. I think this describes Steve. So how do we say goodbye to such a wonderful man? Everyone loved Steve. What was not to love? I think part of what helps us to say goodbye is knowing that Steve is in the hands of our gracious God who made himself known to us in Jesus Christ our Lord.
As I said earlier, Steve never questioned his faith in God. It was a given for him. He was here in church worshiping every Sunday from childhood. If he was well, he was here. He took Jesus' teachings to heart and he lived them. His service to the church, his service to his family, his service to the community were all an expression of his gratefulness to God for life, for blessings. Steve was a blessing to us and we can be grateful for all of the time that we had with him and all of the life and the love that we shared with him. And so we reluctantly relinquish him to his God and our God. We trust him to the good hands of our good shepherd. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house there are many places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to Jesus, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. So from now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Steve knew the Father very well and we trust him to the Father's hands, to the Father's house, and to the eternal life that Jesus has prepared for him and for us. Let us pray. O oh God, before whom generations rise and pass away again, we praise you for all your servants who, having lived this life in faith, now live eternally with you. Especially we thank you for your servant, Steve, for the gift in his life, for all in him that was good and right and beautiful, for his servant heart, for his deep kindness, his selfless love, for his commitment to his community, to his church and his deep devotion to his family. We pray this day for all who shared life with Steve, for those who loved him, for those who will miss him, for those who shared his life's journey. We especially remember his wife Carol, his daughters Stacy and Sarah, his son-in-laws, David and Mark, his grandchildren, Nicholas, Nathan, Nolan, Isabel, and Sophia. We also pray for his sisters and brothers, for Pat, Sheridan, Janet, and Robert. Draw near to them in a special way in these days that your steadfast love and encouragement may lead, guide, and support them in the way that they need it most. Lord Jesus, we remember that you said, I am the resurrection and the life. Help us to trust your word. Lord, you consoled Martha and Mary in their distress. Draw near to us in sadness and dry our tears. Lord, you wept at the grave of Lazarus, your friend. Comfort us in sorrow. Lord, you raised the dead to life. Give our Steve eternal life. Lord, our brother was washed in baptism and anointed with your spirit. He was nourished at your table on earth. 
Welcome him now at your table in the heavenly kingdom. Most loving God, in Jesus Christ you have promised many rooms within your house. Give us faith to see beyond touch and sight some sure sign of your kingdom. And where vision fails, to trust your love which never fails. Give us the courage of faith that we may look forward to glad heavenly reunion in the life to come. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, all is well for Steve. He rests in the grace of God and is at peace. So let us stand and sing again of our trust in God as we sing the hymn Amazing Grace, number 649 in your hymnal.
Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. I will invite you to be seated for the sung blessing.